we will be learning the how of programming by reviewing code examples that demonstrate how lists work, including some of the various subtopics like how to view a list, how to insert new items into a list, how to find certain items inside of a list, how to retrieve the specific item that we find, how to remove items, combine, sort, all of the stuff that we might want to do with lists. Then we're going to talk about range, and range is a really powerful way to make a list. It's a way that we can specify huge lists without having to go in there and manually type everything. And then finally we're going to talk about matrices, which are really just lists inside of lists and different things that we can do to break them up and flatten them down and look at them in different dimensions. So let's get ready to talk about the all-important Python list. Definitely one of the most powerful types in Python comes up all the time as a programmer and you can see why they're so powerful. They can hold integers, floats, strings, they can hold lists of lists, and they all have a few characteristics. So we start with a variable, we use an assignment operator, this equal sign, and then we open a bracket and close a bracket, the square brackets. And inside we put all sorts of different elements, which can be different types. They can be strings, integers, floats, etc. They can be all sorts of different things. And elements are just broken up by these commas. So you can see how easy it is to make a list. And then we can even put lists inside of lists and they will be broken up in the exact same way with the comma in between. Let's run this cell. We now have three lists, our scores, tax code, and mixed. And now let's look at how we view it. So if you're using Jupyter, of course, we have individually running cells. So we can just write scores, which is going to return it. And of course, if you're using an IDE or some kind of other interactive way to work with Python, you could use the print statement and it would do the same thing. And here is something I haven't talked about yet, but later we have an entire video devoted to for loops. So don't worry about the syntax too much. But one way to think about this is that this is a special way to address some kind of logic on each individual element before passing on to the next one. So it would be like, you know, multiply three times three, and then multiply one times three, and then multiply four times three, or whatever it is. In this case, we're just printing that we can break them into their own lines. And now inserting is going to be one of the most common use cases. You're going to maybe create a list and you're going to want to, you know, scrape the internet and like tack on a whole bunch of things to a list or, you know, whatever reason, a database of some kind, and you're going to want to add things to. And any variable that is of the type list has a method called insert. And insert requires two arguments. The first one is the position that you want to insert the element in, and the second one is the element itself. I've got a question for you. Here is our tax code list. You can see that it's Bamfuzzle, Cattywampus, Gargaloo, and Billingsgate. We want to add a loophole to this tax code, and we have specified the number two. What position is it going to end up in? Take a guess. Is that what you thought, the third position? So this is a reminder that Python uses zero indexing. So this is the zero number, this is the one, and this is the two, which makes sense when you think about it from a computer's point of view, but it's not necessarily intuitive to how we would normally count. Normally you would say this is probably the third item in a list, but it's not how Python works. So it's just something to remember. Now, another really powerful way to add an item to a list is to use the append method. And this is really powerful because we don't need to know how long the list is. Instead, we can just say append. And no matter how long the list is, it's going to put this on the end. When we run this cell, you can see that we now have added our loophole, our was loophole, so now we added our was loophole to the end. So now bamfuzzle, cattywampus, loophole, gargaloo, billingsgate, and was loophole are all inside of the tax code. So how are we going to find one of these list items? Because these lists, you could imagine, become thousands or maybe even millions of elements long. How can we find something in an efficient way? Well, Python gives us some really powerful methods to do that also. So here we are making a new variable called letters. And we're creating a list that holds the string. These are single character strings. P, Q, R, S, O, and U. What we can do is actually say, here's the variable of type string dot for accessing our method, use the method index, and check to see if the list is holding the string of character R. So when I run this cell, what do you think is going to happen? Because you'll notice that there is an R, there is a P, but there is not a Z. OK, well, that's what we expected. So it's actually a little more powerful. OK, so that's what we expected, right? We have R, which is in the second position, 0, 1, 2. We have P, which is in the 0th position, the very first one. And then we have Z, which is not in the list at all, so it throws a value error, not in the list. 
you can imagine how powerful that would be if you want to look through you know a database of names and say is this name in there another thing that we might want to find out is how long is our list so we can simply wrap that in len for length when we put our variable of type list in there it will return six for the six items zero one two three four five or one two three four five six so here you can see that it actually does return how many individual elements there are and we don't need to think about it in the terms of zero to six we just think of it as six you know a little tricky there but just something to keep in mind how python indexes sort of on zero but there's still only six elements in it you know but i feel like that's one of those things that like just trips up everybody even good programmers are just like why didn't that come yeah oh yeah that's right zero indexing you know so retrieving something out of a list is also very important Okay, here's a reminder of our text code. Bamfuzzle, cattywampus, loophole, gargaloo, billingsgate, was loophole. So if we want to retrieve an item, there is a very special syntax, and they call this slicing. Whenever you see these two brackets surrounding integers, we're slicing a list up. You know, a couple things to note here is that this is very different from, like, space equals that. That's creating a list with the integer zero in it. This is assuming the list already exists, and it's this variable tax code, and we want the zeroth element. We want bamfuzzle to be returned. Let me run this cell and show you what I mean. So you can see it's actually saying bamfuzzle, and what if we put in one? It's going to bring in cattywampus or two. So this is a way to pull out the third element or the second element from our list. And we can also slice out groups. Very commonly, you're going to want a range of things. So here we want one through three. Now remember, our zero indexing makes this a little confusing. Why don't you take a guess? We have zero, one, two, and three. And we're specifying, give me everything between one and three. So, you know, if you haven't seen this before, you might think, well, it could bring all of these three. It might bring just these two or just these two. But let's run it and see. So we get just cattywampus and loophole. So by slicing the index one through three, we're ignoring zero, makes sense. We're starting with one, then we're getting two, and then surprisingly, we're not getting three. So that's just a reminder that the third element is kind of the one that you ignore. It's going to capture the one right before it. It's not going to include this, but it is going to include that. So I always think of it like this one's included, this one's not included. Now, another interesting thing about slicing is we have the ability to use negatives. So what do you think a negative three is going to do? Take a guess, and then we'll talk about it. Gargaloo. OK, so it brought us this one. Let's look at why. Negative three goes backwards. It loops around the list. We can always assume that this first element is zero, and then we can count up one, two, three. Or in the case of a negative slice, we actually jump and loop all the way around to was loophole. So negative one, negative two, and negative three. Okay? So the way to think about that is actually, let's see, zero, one, two, three. Let's not use three because that is actually the same either way. But something like Billingsgate, you can think zero, loop around, negative one, negative two. So negatives are another really powerful way to jump to the end of a list. Now let's look at how we can save a slice. Um, just a reminder, here's what our text code looks like. Slicing is very powerful in its shorthand notation where we use those brackets with the colon or an individual number, but it's also an, its own function, and its own function comes with more parameters. In fact, it has the ability to step, which is an interesting property. So what we can say is I want to get every other element, every odd element, or every third element. So here there's a function called slice. Now if we look at some of the parameters using our nifty shift tab in Jupyter, we can see that the first argument is for where the slicing starts. The second one is for where it stops. This is very similar to the colon. But then we also have this thing called step, meaning take every second item. So I will save this into a variable, and then we will pass that variable into here. Now remember, that's the same as taking this and doing that. You have something specific you want and then use it as a variable later. But it can be used either way, depending on your purpose. So let's go ahead and make that slice. Now we can see slice zero, none two, just what we specified. Now we're gonna pass that into our tax code and we get out every other element, just like we asked for. So it starts with the zeroth element and then it doesn't take one, but then it does take two and then it doesn't take three and it does take four. 
very cool pattern. Now, if we do one, that's going to be the same as just a range. That's going to give us everything. Or if we do three, it's going to jump all the way to the third one and just give us Bamfuzzle and Gargaloo. And if we add another element there, it would bring that back too. So very cool way to retrieve items. Now, how about removing an item from a list? Because this is another very common thing. Well, it's as easy as using the remove method. Tax code dot remove Bamfuzzle. Of course, we won't get rid of that loophole. But now Bamfuzzle is gone. So you can see right here, it, that was the first element in our list. It went Bamfuzzle, Cattywampus, Gargaloo, and Billingsgate. And now it's just Cattywampus, Gargaloo, and Billingsgate. Just what we wanted. Now let's look at some fun ways to combine lists together. So there's a lot of powerful things we can do here. I won't cover them all. But for example, what if we have a list here of strings? It's all different strings, no integers in here. Code, Mentor, Python, and Developer. Now, if we take this variable and we pass it into an empty variable of type string and we use the join method, it can actually combine these together. So if I went, I don't know, feels like I went kind of fast there, but basically we have, we have our list, okay? It's all made of strings. And then we're saying, just forget that for a second. And then, now we're saying over here, make a new variable and it's got a string inside of it. This could be words, but it's not. It's just empty. It's just one space character. So the string is of one character and it's the space character. So you don't really see anything, but just know it's a string of one space. And then we're saying, hey, you're of type string and you have a special method called join. So when you pass in a list, the join is going to combine all of these together. They're not separated anymore. This is all one word. This is like a paragraph or a title, whereas these are individual elements inside of a list. Now, lists can also hold a different list. So an example of that would be here. We have a list called things, and it's holding strings, uh, an in it's holding a string, an integer, and then a whole nother list. And this list has two more integers, and it also has another integer that's coming in through this variable numbers here, and that has a float. Now, here's a syntax that you don't need to know yet. We're gonna cover this in later videos, but one powerful thing I just wanted to show you that we can do with lists is we can break a string apart into individual characters and then put those individual characters back into a list. So don't worry too much about this. It's called the list comprehension that we're gonna talk about later. One of the cool things it can do is take a string, one space, two space, three, and break it into actual integers. So we've cast it into an integer here. And these are four different integer numbers that we could do math on. And they started out as just numbers that were inside of a string. So maybe you can imagine some situation where you're you know, parsing some text and you're pulling out numbers and then doing math on those numbers. Kind of cool. As long as we're talking about these lists inside of lists, we're basically making groups, right? So let's look at a couple different ways that we can do some more powerful grouping. We have a list here that's just full of a bunch of integers, a bunch of random numbers. And one of the things we can do is create groups of either three or two or four or whatever we want. Now, don't worry too much about the syntax. This is kind of later in the course kind of stuff. But I want to show you that we can actually make an awesome group of four or we can make a group of two. So we've taken all of these elements up here and said, make those two a group, make those two a group, make those two a group. And this group is technically called a tuple, but we'll learn about that in the next video. So it's really cool to be able to take lists and break them up like that. And another neat thing that we can do is actually count them. So this really cool method called max, we can pass in a list and then we can look at a key called x.count. So we can find out that the number one is the most common. You can see that number one occurs three times and all of the other ones only occur once. So pretty neat stuff we can do. That's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to combining. Let's talk about sorting. We'll start with a couple lists here. These numbers are not in order and these words are not in alphabetical order. So just note that to start with. And then we can actually just run them through a function called sorted, which is gonna look for either the smallest to largest number or the alphabetical setting. If we run scores through this function, we see that we're now in order. One, two, three point three, three point three, etc. And another syntax for that is using a dot sort method and then passing nothing into the parameters. So starting with tax code, our list, we can actually use that syntax to put these in alphabetical order. Billingsgate, Bumfuzzle, Cattywampus, and Gargaloo. And then finally, I just want to talk about one way we could reverse a list. We could sort it in backwards order, and that would be to use this negative one saying sort of go backwards with a couple colons before it. And by using this, we can actually sort backwards. So Gargaloo, Cattywampus, Bamfuzzle, and Billingates will be in the reverse order. 
now we have an idea of sorting. So, so we covered a lot. This is an area where you're going to want to keep playing with lists until you get more familiar with them. But now let's talk about ranges, which are a really powerful way to make lists. Next up, let's talk about a special function called range, and it has a lot to do with the way lists work. There is a function here, and it's called range, and it takes a minimum of one parameter. So if you give it one argument, it is going to create something of type range, which is different than type list. But in this case, we're going to want to be using them in the sense of a list. So instead of leaving it at range 6, we're actually going to always be wrapping it in this list here. We can get range to return a list of 6 elements. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 6 elements here. And imagine if we wanted this to be a million long or 100,000 long. Now the way to think of range with one argument is that this is the stop argument. It's going to start at 0 and it's going to go until it's got 6 elements and then it's going to stop. But we can also specify in between some kind of a range. So we can have a start element and a stop element. And in this case, going from 3 to 6, just like with list slicing, this is like list creation. But it's going to go from 3, 4, and 5, creating three elements. And just like the list slicing, it's going to take the start argument and actually make that the number. And then it's going to stop one before the second. Now, if we look here, we can use our shift tab to learn a little bit more. And we'll see that range has another argument, start, stop, and step. This is very similar to how we were using the slice function, where we were stepping every other or every third. And we can do the same thing. So here we're going to create a list. It goes from the elements 2 through 10. So there's going to be 8 elements total, and it's going to be using every other one, which gives us, which gives us, that's right, 2, 4, 6, 8. Which range do we appreciate? This range, this range. You can tell my cheerleader days didn't go too well. Now we can also go backwards. So we can have list range, and we can have 0 through negative 10. And remember, this is going to go around a loop. So what do you think is going to happen here, where we have a negative 10 and a negative 2? Because before we talked about negatives looping back around in a list. But we haven't even created a list loop yet. So what do you think it's going to do? Well, let's find out. Interesting. So negative 2, negative 4, negative 6, negative 8. Who do we appreciate? Yeah, it doesn't really work the same. But it is stepping backwards negative twos, and it is giving us a total of negative 10. So you can see it works about the same way. Now, interestingly, we can put positive steps, and it's not going to be able to go anywhere because it's going to only have negative numbers for its list. So we have to have negatives for here and negatives for here if we're looking to step through a negative range. That's all. Range in a nutshell. Very powerful. Very cool. Very fun way to make lists. I want to touch on the power of lists when they're holding integers and floats and numbers we can work with and thinking of them as multiple dimensional arrays. So we might have something like this, a matrix, which is really a list of lists and it has nothing but numbers in it. It's got two elements, this element and this element, and each of those elements is a list of three items in themselves. But another way to think about it would be in a multidimensional sense. So we could actually think of a y and an x axis and think of it as a 2D array where we have these numbers stacked on top of each other just like a matrix. And one of the things we can do when we start thinking about lists in this way is we can do things like rotate. So here if we take the matrix and we'll use this function that we haven't talked a lot about called zip which combines two different elements together in a special way and we reverse them by using the negative side of the matrix reverse that we talked about earlier. So we can actually output this which is a different arrangement of the matrix that we started with where 4 and 1 are grouped together, 5 and 2 are grouped together and 6 and 3 but then if we break these out also based on the comma the same way we did up here you'll notice that it creates a different shape 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It looks like what we've done is just rotated this around and we have a different shape now. And that's exactly what we did. We rotated a matrix. So imagine like in a video game when you want to move a character around or you want a character to like turn to the right. This is essentially the concept. Pretty neat stuff really when you start thinking about it. Another thing we might want to do is flatten them out. So let's look at some examples of that because there's a bunch of different ways to think about this. So let's start with a multidimensional array. We have one, two, three, four, five, six on separate things. So another way we could actually write this out is using commas and spaces. And this is totally valid. We can run this cell in the exact same way we could have when it was all flattened out. Anytime there is a comma, feel free to drop it down to a new line. And Python will know to keep these all oriented correctly. 
And one of the things we can do is run this sum function over it. And for the second parameter, put a blank list. And look what we get. We get it all flattened out. One, two, three, four, five, six, all in one way. Now, there's a couple more complicated ways to do it. I just wanted to show you. We haven't covered these things, but using list comprehension, we can do it. There's also something called iter tools that can do the same thing. So a bunch of different ways. This is the simplest. So thanks for watching, and let's get our right brain ready for another lesson coming up next. Subscribe to the Mnemonic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.